The hour of four o'clock having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will be in order for the study session today and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom. Present. Council Member Brown is absent. Council Member Watkins. Here. Ms. Bruner. Present. Voluntary Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. And Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, we will move on with the agenda. We are on item one, energy efficient renovations policy development. Uh, we have a packet of information, rather extensive, and we have a presentation by our uh, Sustainability and Resiliency Officer, Dr. Tiffany Wise-West. Dr. West, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It's nice to be here with you this uh, afternoon. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you um, our energy efficient renovations policy that's been in development really to modernize and um, improve the health, safety, comfort, and the climate benefits of our existing building stock. And really, this is the first of an incremental set of policies and voluntary programs, incentive programs that we are expecting to unroll between now and uh, 2030 when we are trying to obtain our emissions reduction targets. So I'm very um, pleased to have this opportunity to do this deeper dive than what we would typically do, obviously, at a, a first reading. Um, so this is the first time we're using this new... Uh, um, clicker and unfortunately right on top got it got it thank you sorry All right, very good. Uh, so I want to introduce to you the folks that have been involved in the development of this. Provide the background. We have been looking at existing buildings for over two years now. Um, share with you the proposed policy requirements, um, the exemptions, provide some examples of this flexible pathway towards compliance and the next steps we have. And then um, I know that um, this is really uh, holding you from going to the national night out as it is all of us. So. Um, I will try to be quick, but uh, we do want to do a deep dive here with you. In terms of introductions, I do want to uh, introduce Taylor Taylor, who is from TRC, our consulting firm. She is um, online on Zoom with us right now on standby. But also, this really has been a collaboration between the planning department and the city manager's office. Um, I want to introduce John Gervasoni, the chief building official, Jackson Day, the green building specialist, Clara Stanger, the senior planner uh, that has been working with us, and of course, Lee Butter Butler, the planning uh, and community development department director. Um, we will all address questions um, as needed. So just a timeline, and I'm not going to read all of this, but our building decarbonization efforts go all the way back to 2020 when we adopted our natural gas ban. Um, in 2022, we began community conversations with different sectors of our community on existing building decarbonization. And I do want to define decarbonization for folks so they know that we're talking about lower carbon fuels, things like biogas, biofuels, biodiesel, renewable energy, energy efficiency, which reduces electricity demand, electrification, shifting from uh, dirty gas to cleaner electricity, carbon capture, and other ways to reduce carbon. So really, we are talking about decarbonization as a whole here. Um, in 2022, we got a grant with Watsonville to decarbonize some existing low-income homes, um, just built a cost-effectiveness tool for that, and um, that will be launching soon for implementation. In 2022, we also adopted our Climate Action Plan 2030, which really gave us these ambitious targets we're working uh, to achieve. In 2023, um, as you know, we had to suspend the natural gas ban, came back later that year with the new construction energy reach code, which your council adopted. And that has just gone into effect in the spring um, after uh, we got approval from the California Energy Commission and the Building and Standards uh, Commission. And in winter of this year, we began work on this energy efficient renovations policy. 
All right. So this is really um, following up on the ambitious uh, energy efficiency measures or efficiency measures rather, rather that California is pursuing. Um, the Air Resources Board has introduced zero emission appliance standards with a phased implementation starting in 2027, meaning some appliances will be no longer available to, pur to purchase, similar to the gas leaf blower that you all heard recently. And all, uh, by 2030, all new space and water heaters sold in California are expected to meet zero emission standards. So the state is uh, driving uh, this push towards more efficiency. But our climate action plan, as you well know, has some ambitious targets, uh, both our legal target of 40% emissions by 2030 from 1990 and the aspirational target of carbon neutral by 2035. More specifically, we have three specific measures related um, to decarbonization. BE5 is to increase resiliency through equitable energy efficiency and local solar programs. And BE2 is to electrify 31% of existing buildings by 2030 and 53% by 2035. Just to show you what we're talking about in terms of emissions reductions, this is called a wedge diagram. And what this shows is how we're gonna reach our 2030 target, meaning we have to reduce 76,000 metric tons of emissions to reach our target. BE2 is the area that we're toning in on, and that represents 17% of the total reductions needed. So this is a, a good area for us to focus on. Um, because there are uh, there is a large amount of emissions reductions that we can attain and this policy as I'll show you shortly is gets at 96% of our building stock Okay, also just as a side note we are in parallel decarbonizing our city building stock We do have one measure that pertains to that and in addition to our first battery storage unit um, that was installed by the water department earlier this year. We've been replacing our water heaters with electric. Um, we upgraded our lighting. We've um, started to replace HVAC and so forth. So we're trying to walk the talk ourselves here um, with respect to decarbonizing our building stock. So how do buildings use energy? We've got a lot of little uh, diagram uh, icons on the screen here. Um, we have, uh, we can use energy from renewables. You see that sun pointing up to the solar panels. Um, you see the little battery symbol to the right of that, which um, shows that you can have a battery storage system, which both can receive and store uh, electricity as well as dispatch electricity. You see the little gas icon, that's for uh, gas furnaces, other gas appliances in the home. You see the little thing that looks like a film reel? That's meant to depict the building envelope. So how tight is our insulation? What about our windows? That, so that's, uh, those in, in and of themselves are energy efficiency measures. Lighting, of course, and then we have over on the far right-hand side, water heating and a vehicle that potentially could use electricity. So just a starting point on how our buildings use electricity. And then when are building energy decisions made? Well, they're made when they're built, right? Which our uh, new construction ordinance would apply. When something breaks, which is a repair, or when a building is undergoing a major addition or alteration. And that is really the trigger that we're looking at for this ordinance. When we looked uh, two years ago uh, at existing buildings, we looked at things like building performance standards. Um, we looked at uh, time of sale, should we require something. And this uh, time of permit uh, at a major addition or alteration is really a modest step that we're bringing forward, but one that we feel, again, can help us to achieve the building comfort, health, uh, performance, safety, and of course, the emissions reductions. So what's a major addition? and, and it, Pardon me if you know this already, but this is any change to the existing building that increases the conditioned floor area and conditioned volume of the building. And we're proposing that a major addition is adding 350 square feet or more to a building. Now, other requirements in order to trigger this, uh, this ordinance would be that the project would require a building permit and it, of course, must comply with state and local requirements. Um, any addition also requires a number of different trades and expertise to be involved. And a contractor will have a number of different trades involved in their project. So an example of this, and we will come back to this example with 
how to how compliance can be achieved. A single family home, it adds 350 square feet, such as a second story addition with two new bedrooms and a full bath, and has a project valuation at 230,000. So that's an example of a major addition. Like I said, we'll come back to that. For a major alteration, it is very similar, but it's any construction or renovation of a, an existing structure other than a repair or addition. And again, it's altering 350 square feet or more of existing floor space. The other requirements are the same with respect to the permit, the type of expertise, and the trades involved. And you can see uh, this example that, again, we'll come back to a single family alters 350 square feet of floor area, like converting two bedrooms in a hallway to three bedrooms and adding a new uh, bathroom. Project valuation uh, here is reported at 135,000. Um, and again, we're gonna come back to that. So now let's jump into what our proposal is for um, what this ordinance might look like. So to set this up, we are focusing right now on single family homes. Single-family homes represent 96% of the buildings in the city. I, I'm sorry, residential uh, represents 96% of buildings in the city. 87% of residential buildings are single-family. So as you can see, this is a really ripe area for us. Notably also, 84% of single-family homes in Santa Cruz are built before 1991. So over 40 years old, or 30 years old rather. and there has been a lot of improvement in efficiency and modernization that's needed in these homes. Um, notably, 95% of our building stock was built before 2010. So um, very interesting. And then multifamily is still under consideration. So we're proposing single family homes to you here today. We're still looking at multifamily, so we're not including that. So here's the policy at a glance. So again, for major residential additions or alterations, we've defined those once again. What would a project applicant have to do? They would have to pick from a menu, a flexible menu of energy efficiency measures, and in some cases, provide outlets and circuits, meaning the, the circuits to get to the outlets, for future zero emission appliances. This ordinance does not apply to small projects, appliance replacements, window projects, roof projects, cosmetic changes, or work that does not require a permit. Notably, it does not require uh, electric kitchen appliances um, or regulate gas stoves. So just want to be really clear that it's, it's very narrow what this applies to. We've analyzed um, our uh, permits and determined that we project this pr uh, proposed ordinance could impact about 300 permits a year with a median project valuation around $130,000. So what do those energy efficiency measures uh, look like? So as you can see, this is really a f flexible compliance pathway. It does not limit fuel choice, meaning we are not saying you can only have to electrify, right? We found from the natural gas ban that the Ninth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals interpreted that that would violate the energy efficiency, the federal energy efficiency standard. So fuel choice must be retained, which we do here. And as you can see, the majority of the measures that we have here um, are energy efficiency. The ones towards the bottom are related to electrification. So the requirement here is that an applicant would install any number and any combination of these measures on the right to add up to a total score of nine or greater. We know that there are over 27 combinations and the requirement for us to get this REACH code approved by the California Energy Commission requires that there must be one what they deem cost-effective option, meaning the costs of uh, the equipment uh, from the start would be offset by the operation of that equipment over the life of the equipment. And we have found that there are at least five cost-effective options um, in these menu of measures and various combinations. There are a couple um, mandatory requirements um, that you see at the bottom. Uh, we have panel-related pre-wiring uh, that we are requiring. And if you touch the me mechanical kitchen uh, or laundry or utility room, 
uh, you do need to do electric ready pre-wiring for a hot water heater or HVAC. So there is some electric, what we call electric readiness requirements. And there's a link down below and an attachment to your uh, agenda report uh, that details the cost effectiveness studies that we utilize to determine cost effectiveness of these measures. So some examples on how this compliance could uh, take place. You could install a heat pump water heater or space heater. And the points that you saw on the previous slide uh, water heater and space heater are 12 and 18. They exceed nine, so that would be one thing each that you could do to meet compliance. You could also install solar PV and do some electric ready pre-wiring um, that's associated with that, which I'll discuss in a moment. You could do floor insulation or install a combination of energy efficiency me measures. For example, you could combine uh, attic insulation and wall insulation together. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, as I said, there's a number of different ways to meet compliance. So in terms of electric readiness, I just wanted to provide an additional slide on this so it's really clear what we're talking about here. Um, if a project um, involves a new electrical panel, so they were already perhaps doing that for their project, or a service upgrade to 200 amps, um, again, they will have to provide electric readiness components, i.e. circuits and outlets um, for space heating and water heating appliances. If an alteration or addition include, I already mentioned this, work in the utility kitchen or laundry spaces, electric readiness components must be installed. And lastly, if installing solar PV to achieve compliance, you must also include electric readiness for either electric water heating, space heating, and either energy storage or EV charger ready. And I believe the latter two are already required by code, but we wanted to make it clear um, that that was the case. So that's electric readiness. There are some proposed exemptions here. Um, we, this does not need to tr be triggered by a repair. Also, pre-compliance is possible. So if you've previously installed measures from that table that can demonstrate um, to the building official that they'll count towards that score, they can be counted. For example, if you had previously installed solar PV, well, that would take away one compliance avenue for you, so it should be considered. So that's what we're talking about with pre-compliance. Also for hazard mitigation, for example, if you're going in and doing seismic retrofits to your foundation, this will not be triggered by that. Temporary structures are uh, exempt. And we also have an exemption for cost burden. So if the costs associated with the ordinance compliance exceeds 20% of the project valuation, we are proposing that the chief building official can lower the compliance point threshold requirement such that the cost is at or below 20% of the project valuation. So flexibility with respect to costs. Um, again, only touching roof or windows or roof and windows, exempt and manufactured homes are exempt. So a number of different exemptions to uh, tailored to site circumstances. I will mention that ADUs are not exempt if the triggers are met. Okay, some cost impacts, and we're getting really close here to the end. The cost impacts of the proposed policy, as I mentioned before, our medium project valuation from our permits we know is 130,000. We modeled that the estimated typical cost of compliance, and this is exclusive of rebates and incentives, which are exist in mass right now, and I will tell you more about that, um, is 6,600. So that's a 5% uh, cost increase for a typical project valuation that's applying uh, to comply with this under the 20% uh, cost threshold for an exemption, and again, why? It's because single families are really one of the best opportunities to make these improvements in homes. Okay, going back to the major addition examples. I'm not gonna repeat kind of the 350 square foot adds a second story, 230K. How can, we com how can an applicant comply? And again, there are multiple pathways, this is just one. So in this case, <clears throat> the project applicant can choose a heat pump water heater to comply and LED light bulbs. The total compliance cost is about $6,700, a 3% cost increase. 
again, without incentives. The measures are cost effective and the rebates and incentives are approximately up to 5,000, although that is income tiered. So the lower the income, the higher in incentive. So here on net about 1750 um, for cost of compliance. For a major alteration, just to remind you, this is converting two bedrooms and a hallway into three bedrooms and renovating the kitchen. Um, the project valuation seems low for this, but let's assume it to be 135,000. For this example, uh, the project applicant chooses a heat pump water heater, um, electric circuit and outlets for an electric cooktop, so a future electric cooktop, not one now, and installs LED lighting. Total cost of compliance, 7,500, so increases to about 5.5% of the overall project valuation. And again, can be defrayed by about 5,000 uh, in rebates that exist right now. So just to be really clear again about what this policy does not do. It does not regulate the use of gas cooking equipment or other kitchen equipment or appliances. It does not require electrification. It is not triggered by small projects or work that doesn't require a permit or again, single appliance replacements. And again, it's, it considers on-site challenges or considerations. In terms of resources that are available right now, Central Coast Community Energy has direct incentives of 4,600 to 5,300 on up, depending on what you're doing. We expect those to be in place um, and durable for some time. We do know also that there's limited applicability of the state's self-generation incentive program, but it is available. Um, also, we have a new regional energy network that's being stood up by AMBAG coming online next year. And most, most RENs, Renewable Energy Networks, provide tra workforce development training, which we're hoping for, as well as more incentives. So we're anticipating that in 2025. The Inflation Reduction Act has substantial tax credits available for residential energy upgrades right now, about 30% for each improvement, but there are caps per measure and in total on a given tax year. Um, we are exploring services right now to help community members navigate complicated projects. There are services like Quick Carbon out there who can help them make decisions on which uh, products to purchase, how to uh, access the rebates and so forth. So we're evaluating that right now, um, how to make sure that we have uh, some assistance in place. And last, I just wanted to mention that we're resubmitting a HUD, a pro-housing grant proposal that we found that we didn't uh, get recommended for, but the second round is coming up later uh, this summer for low income decarbonization and resilience in frontline neighbors hoods. And that was combined with tenant protections and affordability uh, policy work. So that's coming as well. And obviously we'll provide some incentives for lower income folks. Okay. Oops. There we go. All right. So in terms of engagement, um, in addition to, you know, prior engagement with the cap and with our uh, source energy reach code, we have had to date, a couple virtual webinars. We do have our decarbonization page that has all of the slide decks, our frequently asked questions, and we have a survey open right now that's going to run through October to receive feedback as we refine and hone this um, policy. I will mention our Climate Action Task Force did a deep dive with us also and provided really valuable food feedback that has already been integrated. Some of the things that we've been hearing have we considered points for low emissions refrigerants? Have it yet, but great idea. Technical clarifications, where can folks find help? How's project valuation determined? determined? <clears throat> Questions about cost effectiveness, what is electric readiness, the applicability to ADUs, and so forth. And, and those are described also in your agenda report. This QR scan tag takes you to the building decarbonization webpage and survey, if anyone is interested. Okay, last slide. So what's next? Um, we are uh, conducting. <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me. We are conducting more community engagement, including we're me meeting with the Realtors Association soon. Um, we will be having a community event where this will be featured, and we'll be uh, getting feedback October 11th. The 17th, we'll be going to Planning Commission. And then uh, we're targeting bringing the first reading of an ordinance to council on November 26. 
Um, after the second council reading, assuming that uh, an ordinance is adopted, we would file with the California Energy Commission and the California Building and Standards um, Commission. We need permission from them in order to put this in place. And then we are proposing April 1 for the code to take effect. Lastly, I'll just mention that um, <coughs> Marin, Chula Vista, Santa Monica, Ohio, West Hollywood are all advancing similar policies. San Luis Obispo, Berkeley, um, Marin has already done so. So just a little bit of a, a peer kind of comparison as to um, what others are doing. But this is becoming, what we are trying to do or what we're proposing is becoming kind of the standard similar to how our uh, new construction reach code is kind of becoming the standard as folks are getting away from the gas bug ban and going towards something different. This type of structure seems to be where jurisdictions are going for existing buildings also. With that, I am really happy to take any questions and feedback that you might have. I'll remind you that this is just a study session. We wanted to bring this to you early um, and hear your feedback and, of course, do the deep dive to, to ensure that you all understand where we're coming from with what we're bringing forward right now. Dr. Weiswas, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate the presentation and <laughs> the additional material that's in our packet. Let me begin uh, by asking council members if you have questions. Mr. Newsom, we'll start here. We'll move this way. Okay. Council member. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. I understand where this is coming from and, and why you're bringing this forward, so I, I appreciate that. And I know we're trying to reduce um, you know, it, carbon, but also pressure on the, on the grid, and so these types of things really do help. Um, you, I, one of my questions was the ADUs, but you brought that up, that those will be applied. So um, that's, that's good to know. Um, do you feel like that, I do, I just know that in general, renovations for single family homes are expensive, right? And so I'm wondering if over time, you know, if we'll be able to track whether or not pe this will be the thing that will kind of be the added issue that will make it really hard for people to do a renovation on their home. I don't know. I, I just know it's really expensive um, and often more costs more in the end than you even budget for. So it'd be interesting to know kind of or to track over time kind of what this could influence. I guess the question would be also, do you anticipate the kind of the cost going down as the industry kind of responds essentially to creating more of these types of appliances and measures that, uh, you know what I mean, like the market might respond eventually, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely we expect the costs to go down, although there are five cost-effective combinations right now. Many of the measures that we're showing you are, you know, have been age-old energy efficiency measures, right? Tight windows, insulation, that kind of thing. Tried and true technology. I think you're talking more about the electrification, right. which are the higher dollar costs in some cases. Um, but yeah, we do expect as uh, the market matures, as more and more of these um, uh, regulations come online, yes, costs should come down. Also costs with, um, I think, contractors really understanding, making sure they understand what they're doing. There will be some efficiencies achieved there. Um, on your other question about will it be hard to do renovations, like is this the last straw that maybe makes people not make that decision? I'm not really sure where we have that in the process where we track. I think we could anecdotally track something like that when we're in kind of the discussions um, with potential applicants about their projects. Um, I do know that our new um, land use uh, planning software will allow us to track these kind of permits in a little bit more granular detail than we do right now. Approximately how many, I would, I'm sure it's probably in the agenda report, and I apologize that I don't remember, but approximately how many, like, do you anticipate this will apply to? 300 permits per year is what we're yeah. expecting. We went back and analyzed five years of permitting data to come up with that number. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a good amount. Um, the other question I have, and I think Lee won't be super surprised by it, but, and it might not even apply, but since it's a study session, I thought I'd just bring it up, <laughs> is the... Um, the filters on the washing machines. Oh, yeah. And I know it's not a decarbonization ad, but if we are encouraging more um, environmentally friendly tools for these types of renovations, 
could we encourage single family homes to also um, have a filter for the microplastics that are released into the oceans from their washing machines, which is proven to be one of the best things you can do to reduce microplastics in the oceans? <laughs> I'm with you on my support of that. That's definitely something I would need to talk to the planning team about. Okay. I think there's potential avenues, like even in the green building program, okay. you know, if, because probably doesn't fit in, in this, this in particular this, uh -huh. ordinance, but I think there might be other ways. And I know that, uh, Lee has been thinking about that as well. I know, and we talk, talked about it for the newer, bigger developments, but it's not quite so many. And so since majority of our housing stock is single family residents, and if we're asking them to make these types of improvements, I'd love if, my, if the council colleagues are supportive to look at some policies that might work in that regard. Okay. I'll Noted, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bruner. My questions have been answered, thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you for the work and the report. I do have a couple of additional questions and apologies if you um, touched on it and I missed it. How did we land on 350 square feet? It's in alignment with our um, green building program. Okay. I and mean, I'm sure that had a whole process of how we landed on that. Um, can you re-explain the ADU piece? It's just that ADUs are not exempt. So if they meet the the triggers, for example, the 350 square foot addition or alteration, mm. and they don't meet one of the exemptions, okay. then they would need to comply with the ordinance. And so that I read in the report that there was a concern or a suggestion that it go that it be increased to 500 square feet because ADUs are already expensive and hard to bring to um, legalization. And so the reason that we wouldn't consider that is because the 350 square feet is in alignment with our green building. Okay. Yes, that's the, that's the approach we've taken. Okay, and then really the question I have, all my other questions have been answered, is um, how are we preparing ourselves, our teams, um, in terms of capacity to respond to the community um, if and when this goes into effect? Uh, how are we going to be ensuring that these exemption lists and the choices that they have is going to be articulated in a way that's easily digestible and accessible to community members. So what are we doing internally if this passes? What are we doing internally to make sure we're helping the community every step of the way? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. The outreach, should something be adopted, is obviously going to be critical, right, to make sure that folks know this, particularly our developer designer uh, community. Also, as I mentioned, we really are looking at services. I mentioned Quick Carbon, and there are others that can help people through this process, especially for complicated projects. So that would be a resource that maybe would go in a little deeper depth than say someone can come up to our permit counter and ask for help with. Mm -hmm. um, I do think internally, and I don't know if the um, if the planning department wants to talk about this, but they're definitely, you know, internally there will be a shift in, you know, what compliance means when permits come in. So there will need to be training on that as well, obviously. I don't know if planning wants to say anything else on that, but um, I think, you know, capacity is always an issue mm -hmm. internally, um, but I can't speak to that on behalf of the planning department in terms of implementation, but it is something that we um, are aware of that we will likely need to bring on maybe some positions that have been uh, vacant for some time. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that that's um, top of mind for folks, because I think if we're asking something this big of the community, then we need to be able to um, respond effectively. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, how many businesses attended that initial session? And um, actually, you answered the second part of my question through the slides. I'm just sure. How we're going to continue to engage them through this process until it comes to council. Yeah, not many. And it yeah. was unfortunate because we sent um, right. mailers to over 500 um, right. businesses that at all would be affected by this um, ordinance. Um, and is unfortunate. I think we had like a handful. I have the exact number cited in mm. here, but it was it was less than six. So not great, but you know, did some really heavy promo of it, mm -hmm. and not over. I mean, we do have a lot more time for uh, engagement and to hear from folks and refine this. Yeah, I mean, maybe timing of summer might have been a contributor. So I think sure. another robust outreach to the businesses would be prudent on our part. Last question. 
um, with my grant hat on, um, does this, if this passes, does this set us up for additional resources? Because we'd be on the front end of addressing this. It does. Um, definitely having a policy in place, um, I think, increases the competitiveness when we're applying for things. So I, I think so. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I know I was the only dissenter and total opponent to the overall gas prohibition. And I have to say, I appreciate the compromises and the work that the that Tiffany and um, your team have done to bring this forward. I think this is a, a great um, step in the right direction. I do have a couple of questions. And I'm going to start with kind of piggybacking on what you said. Um, I think being on the leading edge of things kind of makes me nervous, but I understand that that makes us grant ready. But I think when we were on the leading edge of some things where we're trying to uh, achieve state goals that for some people seem you know, unattainable, we, we risk other things, right? Like we, we had to change and a lot of lost work and time and money and sometimes, you know. But um, having heard that from you, I think that that's the why to why we want to be on the leading edge too, and that makes sense to me. So thank you for saying that. I'm wondering, um, in terms of something else that Council Member Kalantari Johnson brought up is, and I don't know if it's possible, but I have heard from members of the building trades and um, um, other community members that it's difficult to, to get access to people at the counter. So if we need to add staff time so that there's somebody always at the counter, whether or not they can answer the question, but they can take the question and field the question, um, a person, instead of having to call in or going around the building it's, it's frustrating from people's perspective that I've heard from constituents. Um, and so I, I think if we have to allocate for that, I think that's important. And, and I don't know if that's possible. So I guess that's a, I guess it's a question or maybe a comment, but. Um, um, I'll note it. I, it's okay. something that the planning department would, would really need to um, address. Um, with that said, you know, we do also, if folks can't come to the counter, they can email and ask questions, right? So. We do have multiple formats that folks, but point taken, we yeah, have limit, I, we I have am, limited I've hours. I've heard that it's very frustrating, and some people, you know, there there's people of different generations that might not sure. use email, of and course. it's just we have. I want to be mindful that if we are making big changes, that we're available. We're in a customer service business. Yeah, that's certainly something we can look into further, Councilmember Golder. I appreciate you raising it. I do. I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Director Butler, but I do know that the team has tried to align counter hours with the hours that are most convenient for contractors based sure. on their early morning Perfect. schedule and high traffic times. But that's not to say there might not be other adjustments we can make to just ensure that they're available um, as much as possible. Right. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and a concern that I had heard from um, electrical contractors and constituents was that if we moved right away, if everything moved today to all electrification or five years from now, the grid wouldn't be ready. And so I really appreciate the compromises and the look at it, a more holistic approach. I do have a question. I had read something somewhere, and I don't know what it is, and maybe you touched on it here, was that there was something where there were, and maybe it was pg &E, was de-incentivizing people purchasing rooftop solar in some way, like it was making it where it's not cost effective. And so I don't know if you can speak to, have you seen a decrease in people purchasing it or do you anticipate that because of? So what you're referring to is the shift that pg &E made in their um, time of use pricing. Um, it's called net energy metering and it happened last year. What it did was change the period when solar is valued the most. It changed it from the middle of the day when solar produces to the end of the day when solar isn't producing. And so what net metering is, is as you're producing from your solar, it's basically crediting your bill. And because the credit is now, uh, the peak is later in day, your credit during the day when your solar is producing is less. We've heard that the value of solar has been decreased by about a third because mm -hmm. of this change by PG&E. So that is correct, that the value of solar has shifted, unfortunately, due to uh, pricing changes at PG&E. And I'm wondering, is there any work with our lobbyists around trying to look at that at a state level? Because yes. it's, that's a big investment for somebody to make. It's you know 30000 to $40,000 if they're putting in batteries. Mm -hmm. And if it is something that we think is important, 
people aren't going to put do that investment if they're not going to get a return on their investment and still have to pay PG&E. Yes, we've been um, we've been tracking various pieces of legislation, stalled legislation, and been providing letters of support. Um, <clears throat> for our solar industry. So we are 100% behind our solar industry to try to help and make sure that sol solar is still a good cost-effective investment, which it is in some cases, particularly for larger users of electricity where the payback is faster. Is that something that Southern California Edison is doing as well or just PG&E, do you know? Um, so? I'm not sure if, if it, has been doing with, it, it has been done with other IOUs. I'm not sure that they've shifted from NEM 1.0 to 3.0. All right. Well, thank you. And then um, I just wonder, how is this code different than our existing green energy code? Do you have like a before and after for like specifics? Because a lot of it looked kind of the same it is, to it's, me. It's very complementary and dovetails with our existing green building program. I don't know if Jackson wants to kind of share with us anything beyond that, but it is completely aligned. There are no conflicts. It really supports our green building program and the checklist. Is there anything else to say on that? Right. What Jackson just said is that um, this is pertaining to energy, which of which the green building does address the green building program, but it also is more holistic, right? It's looking at other things beyond energy um, with respect to the building itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just. I'm wondering if we if there's a way to track over time what this would add to this cost per square foot for construction because that always does get passed on to, you know, the whoever's in there, the homeowner or the um, it's going to get passed on to tenants. It has to be so. It's it's. Um, I'm just wondering if there's and I, you gave some great examples, so I appreciate that. But if if we if there's a way to track it. Great. If not, I understand. It's well, kind of complicated. We do track project valuation and square yeah. footage. So that is something we already track and will be tracked going forward okay. um, to be able to calculate the cost per square footage. Okay. And I think that was all my questions. Thank you. I'm glad you went to me last because you knew you saw my list. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Wise-West, uh, you indicated that uh, this would probably affect about 300 projects a year Correct. on a base of how many? <sighs> I'm not sure what that is. Do you guys know um, about how many permits per year in total? 1,600 I'm getting uh, from Lee, 1,600 total permits Just per make year. make sure we get it on. <clears throat> yes, sir. Chief Building Official, sorry about Good that. afternoon, sir. Uh, but, yeah, we would issue probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to uh, 2,500 permits within a year. A lot of those being like mechanical, plumbing, electrical, so they don't count. The actual building permits that we'd be looking at, yeah. uh, on an average, probably about six to 750. So it would be about half of those. About half of those. Thank right. you. Uh, Dr. Weisweiss, could you put up that uh, slide which indicated how many single-family residences and so on? Let's go to that for a second. Sorry. Um, it's the one with the pie graph, correct? The one with the 97%? I'm so sorry, this is it's okay. not it's okay, fine. now it's going. Okay. Or I don't know if that's me or you guys doing it, but I think it's me. We're doing fine. Okay, right Thank here. You. Thank you. So and so the base here the existing housing stock has a actual number of we have about 2,400 households, 2,400, or I'm sorry, 24,000 households, yeah, pardon good, me. Good. Yes. <laughs> 24,000 structures, no? I believe that is more dwelling units. Dwelling units. It's dwelling units, yes. Dwelling, 24,000 dwelling units. Right, so that would include multifamily units, single family units. Yes. Yes. Okay, and so we get about 600, 650 
we process about 650 roughly applications a year. About half of those would be eligible is our best estimate at this point. So you got 300 a year coming into compliance roughly on a base of 24,000 residences. And so in 10 years, we, not we, the property owners would, about 3,000 every 10 years, right? Yes. Okay. And so if we get that kind of compliance, it's going to be a very large number of years before the ha any significant portion of the housing stock, let's say 25% of the housing stock or even 20% of the housing stock has now gotten to a level of efficiency and consumption of electricity that that's doing pretty well. Correct. So far? Yes, correct. However, yeah. do remember that there will be both state code improvements mm -hmm. over time and mm -hmm likely other complementary ordinances or other um, uh, voluntary programs that would complement this that then would gain us more efficiency and greater uh, decarbonization. So in terms of hitting our targets in a timely manner, uh, let's go to the time frame on the targets, sure. if we could for a second. Thank you. So here is what we're looking at for the reductions to 2030. There we go. And so by 2030, and we're in 2024, so within six years, we eight, 1, 000, roughly 1,800 parcels uh, uh, buildings would have, mm -hmm. whether they're single family, multifamily, ADUs, whatever it may be. So some mix gets us to about 1,800 of those. And it's your sense that that 1,800 units by 2030 gets us this reduction you're talking about? No, it does not. Okay. It starts to etch away at that number, mm -hmm. but there are a set of policies that will need to come forward or voluntary programs to get to that 13,000. We are still, that 13,000 metric tons of CO2 reduced, we are still, there has not, uh, we had not previously calculated what is the average emissions reduction per Mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. that is in progress right now with our consultants mm -hmm. so then we could apply that number that you just mentioned that 300 uh, units times six that uh, 1800 times whatever the metric tons is to see how far do we get into that 13,000 mm -hmm. so that's just the potential um, that we need to to get to for existing buildings regardless of the policy prescription with regard to what looks to me like the gray area uh, in here, T4, I'm assuming. It looks gray to me. That's, that's uh, EV charging. I'm an old man. It may, it may be purple for all I know. <laughs> uh, so that's transportation. That is. is that right? Yes. And you and I have had this conversation. I think the council has had this conversation. If we did everything but don't change the fuel types and transportation and generating electricity, the world will fail on, on our efforts on climate change. So the, we're putting a lot into the T's that are on there because that's a target-rich environment. Indeed. And the change in electricity really, to some extent, we have some control of that through triple C E and so on, where we're moving in the direction of creating the demand side. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, so on this, on this aspect of it, because I think there's a there's at least a legitimate question around cost per ton of reduction mm -hmm. here, and that's of interest to me. Uh, understanding that. Uh, do you have anything to, uh, could you speak to that a bit? 
We do not. Um, we have not calculated that. Um, it was not something that we did during our climate action plan process because we only estimated costs relative to one another. So we don't didn't have exact calculations of measures. I do know that for BE2, which again is existing buildings, uh, we estimated the uh, cost for compliance citywide. Granted, that was to electrify buildings, so it's not really apples to apples to what we're considering now, but it was, um, I believe, $300 million for residential. That's citywide. Yes, right. So theoretically, we could take that cost, divide it by the 13000 mm -hmm. and come up with a cost per metric ton. However, we don't have that for the other measures, so it would be difficult to compare. Mm -hmm. Um, it is something, however, that I could, um, you know, I could talk to like our, our transportation planner because certainly when they're preparing grant proposals and so forth, it's very likely they have to estimate emissions avoided or emissions reduced by some of their projects. Mm -hmm. So we could get a sense, you know, it wouldn't be like a T1 has, you know, X dollars per metric ton. It would mm -hmm. be more like examples yes. of types of projects. But that is something, and in fact, uh, as we do have, you know, our once a year uh, check-in, that is something we can work towards with our progress update for the end of the year, beginning of the year. Um, it is something that we can do for BE2 now, but I think you want to be able to compare, right? Understanding that it may be less than exact or precise understanding there may be a range in there in, in each one of those categories potentially uh, I think it would be useful to know even in broad terms the answer to that question thank you well thank you uh, I'll just use I'll abuse the opportunity that I have here just to say uh, I was the author of the solar energy net metering bills back in the day and what we hoped for <laughs> uh, uh, um, was something different than the way the investor-owned utilities and, and frankly I understand over time their issue which is a subsidy issue they have they have user groups and it's a cross user group subsidy question because the cost doesn't change for the IOU, the total cost isn't changing, it's who's paying it. And at the outset, the incentive was very good, I thought. <laughs> uh, and and I, it is becoming less so as time moves on because the utilities under pressures to essentially end the cost shifting. And uh, do you have any sense of as time moves on, I don't expect the PUC. The PUC seems pretty locked into their belief system how they're Agreed. doing. How they're doing it. The legislature is always less so. It, 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 it's less so. Do you have any sense where the ledge and the governor may be moving on this issue? It, I have not heard anything recently since the push to NEM 3.0. Mm -hmm. With that said, we do have control as a local CCA to be able to incentivize solar PV and have chosen not to up to this point. Um, that is a difference between our CCA and some other CCAs. Some do support solar and others don't. Mm -hmm. So that is one area where we do have um, uh, yourself and, and the right. city manager sit on those boards. So exactly. that is one area where we have more control. We have a meeting coming up, not too distant future, and some annual hoot nannies coming up of some kind yes. over there. <laughs> uh, and uh, my wife, by the way, told me I shouldn't use the phrase hoot nanny. Nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, okay, we okay. Did, I do. Of, no, yeah, all right, yeah. News about he's too young up. to know. He, <laughs> doesn't, he doesn't know what it is. Um, anyway, uh, maybe the city manager and you and I can have a brief conversation Certainly. about that. And thinking that through. Certainly. Yeah. That I, I agree with. That is a locus of potential decision making or moving on, on, on that issue. Thank you very much. Uh, this would be the opportunity for a member of the public to. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Please do. Go ahead. Go ahead. If I may. So uh, I'm wondering a couple of other things. 
have we thought about surveying people to see what they already have in their homes in some way? And I don't know what um, that could look like, but I just, when you're reading through what was there, we, people might already be in compliance through doing their own wanting to save energy. Um, so I don't know if that's possible but or, or even necessary, but... Well, we do have a sense from the permits that have come through. Previously, our previous land use tracking software didn't give us a lot of granular detail, but that's how we were able to go back and see how many um, complied. So we do have a sense of the types of projects that are coming forward, but there really is no way to know every project that's been completed in every home over time. Um, that's you know very difficult to know. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If there's 24 dwelling units, 24,000 dwelling units, how many people have already put in floor insulation? Yeah. You don't need a permit for that, would you? you? Right, and so they might have just done it because they had rats, and then so it's like there might have been people that are already doing some of these things, sealing the holes that they, are already happening. So when you were saying to meet that number, it might already be happening, and we just don't know also. So we, that was a thought. And they would get credit for that because pre-compliance gives you credit. Yeah, but if they even never came before us in the, you know, right in the 50 process. years that they were alive, but but, they're, but they did it all, yeah. and then we wouldn't know if we did, if there was no way to track it, no way to capture it. Um, and then I see what you're saying, and that, that is a question that I, I don't know how, how it would work at the state level, is like similar to our water use, right? Like when Rosemary said that people were doing all this water saving, and but the cost is still the same, and so I don't, I really don't understand how that works. But it definitely would de-incentivize people doing their own because it's a big initial investment. So I'm curious to learn more ab ab about what that is. And um, I guess that was my only last question or comment. But it was like, but that is what you meant, right? Because that's what, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask if members have additional questions that were stimulated by other <laughs> comments. Thank you. This would be the opportunity for members of the public to address the council on this matter for a period of time up to three minutes. As you're approaching, let me see, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Yes. Okay. So we'll start with you and then we'll toggle back and forth between people online and people in council. Good evening and welcome. Good afternoon. Good to see you, Mayor Keeley and council members and Tiffany. I worked with Tiffany for a couple of years on the Climate Action Plan uh, Task Force. I have some answers to some of the questions that have been asked here, so I'm probably going to run out of time. But as far as uh, monitoring what's already been done, Tiffany has the uh, Resilient Central Coast program going, and that might give you some answers as to who's already uh, doing things in compliance. Um, the uh, NEM 3 program is a state program. It is all, all the um, IOUs are involved in that. And uh, what we've seen, I'm working with some statewide coalitions, and what we've seen is about an 80% reduction in uh, new solar adoption. And what we've heard from the 3CE about that is that because we actually have way more solar coming into the grid, during uh, midday, that it actually has to be curtailed or, or exported. And so we are trying to, I'm with the Electric Vehicle Association, and we're trying to encourage people to charge their vehicles during the day, but if you're working and don't have a place to charge in, then that's a problem. And I know Tiffany has, plan or not Tiffany, but the city has plans for a number of uh, charging stations to make it more available for people. Um, so I, I did have a question. I came in a little bit late. Is this policy only uh, triggered when somebody is doing a renovation? Is that it? Okay. Um, let's see. So, oh, so 3CE has said uh, because there's so much solar coming into the grid during the day, they are not encouraging new solar unless people have also um, are installing battery storage because then it can be utilized and that makes sense and not too far into the future we will be seeing electric vehicles having bi-directional charging capacity so they will be able to either uh, supply electricity to their homes or the grid if they choose to there's a, a number of things that need to be put into place before that can happen 
Um, uh, let's see. I can hardly read my notes. Uh, oh, um, according to the figures of 3CE, 70% of our emissions on the five county central coast are coming from vehicles. The policies that are being enacted are completely not going to get it. Um, and policies that do include the buses are really um, fooling themselves because our buses are run by CNG, which is mostly methane, which has a 120 to 80 times the heating capacity of CO2. And the hydrogen buses, the 57 that have been ordered, have even worse, 95 to 98% coming from fossil fuel. So thank you. Thanks thank for all of your work, all of you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. We're going to take the next person online, then, sir, we'll be right with you. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Yes, sir. Um, I'll just say a few words. Uh, I, I point out that many houses in Santa Cruz, you know, there were studs out remodeled in the recent past, and they're not then 40 to 60 years old in efficiency, including mine, but are really somewhat modern. I fail to see how pre-wiring, if it's not intended to be used, is cost effective, but I don't have the climate change mind virus. I'm uh, concerned about garage ADU conversions or additions since garages and some additions are always over 350 square feet, and it seems to demand a change then to the entire rest of the house along these requirements. If so, maybe I have that wrong, I know it sounds like it, uh, that, that isn't necessarily cost effective, and more so, I find this especially onerous uh, because it's basically an ex post facto type law since the rest of the house was legal when it was built, and forcing the rest of the house to remodel to meet these uh, kinds of uh, technologies seems uh, overkill. And again, it's sort of it's a matter of principles, constitutional principles, which seem to be ignored here. There's overwhelming evidence the energy supply demand equation has two problematic components. New renewable electrical generation while growing doesn't keep up with demand growth, which is estimated to soar to 30 to 75 percent more needed uh, by 2050. And it's made worse when we take fossil fuels offline. We actually need all the energy we can get. And this uh, drives gas use uh, elimination as a source of energy, no matter that you say that it doesn't have to. Uh, these circ measures circumvent the free market by this uh, stack point system. Uh, these studies comparing electrical costs of gas versus solar, for instance, in BTO energy, and then evaluated by energy efficiency uh, is quite difficult because really the price of gas and electricity and even future efficiency are simply unknowns when you go out 10 and 20 years. Uh, they're just making it up. Uh, these study methods then have to use these long-term LSC calculations, making all these assumptions, which, uh, frankly, PG&E is wrong on a monthly basis. So they don't even know what energy will, prices will be uh, in, in a year. They never do. They're always wrong. Um, anyway, only the current energy prices and the current technologies and the free market make for superior uh, non-authoritarian cost-effective economic decisions. Uh, this is definitely going to increase housing costs up front, your specialty. And these studies you cite were uh, directed by biased energy providers. So kind of uh, you get what you pay for in consultant studies using taxpayer dollars to find justifications for the unjustifiable. Uh, in those studies, pg e makes no warranty, express or implied, or assumes any legal liability or responsibility for any accuracy, completeness, or usefulness of any data. <laughs> It has very mild weather, which makes it uh, less important. These measures less important. Thanks. Mr. Phillip, Mr. Phillip, if you are still there, uh, and I don't know if you are. Are you still? I am. Good. Uh, I, I've been meaning to suggest something to you for some time. You call in frequently. I very, We all very much appreciate that, appreciate the participation. I will just tell you, Whatever microphone you're using, it sounds like you're in a swimming pool. So I don't know. It, it is very hard to uh, hear you. And I would suggest, because you put a lot of time into your comments and you comment frequently, you may want to consider whatever it is you're using as a microphone. It's not 
getting all the way I'm through here. Zoom. It's, it's very I, I use automatic muffled. volume control on Zoom. Okay. And maybe that's it. I'll try a different different uh, microphone setting next time. We'll see if it works. Okay. Yeah, very good. I uh, wanted to share that thought with you. I've been meaning to do it for some time. I didn't want to do it during a formal council meeting. This is uh, maybe the best way to do that. So thank you, sir, for your, for your always thoughtful comments. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, I'm Alan Peevers. I know a few of you, Tiffany, I've known for a few years now. I'm a big fan of climate change mitigation, so I appreciate the work you're all doing. It's a big deal. I think this is a promising program, and I think it has to go faster if there's any way to envision how to do it. The two things I came to say are uh, vehicle to grid is a very promising thing in general, and in the context of, of uh, buses, it's even more promising because the amount of energy the buses store. So anything that we can do as a city to procure more electric buses and charging infrastructure thereof, really great progress. And the other point I wanted to make is about the priority of cleaning up the electricity in the first place. So PG&E is in cahoots maybe with the Public Utility Commission. It's kind of a weird, wonky relationship. And they talk about perverse incentives if you listen to Volts. Uh, and they are, you know, they were originally intended to build faster, and so you make money by building stuff. Anyway, be that as it may, maybe we can switch to our own electricity provider. San Jose has done it. So let's look into that. It's called Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and it is greener and cheaper than PG&E, and it didn't even used to exist, and it does now, partially because of community and mayoral engagement. So we should explore getting our own greener electricity. Thanks. Can you stay here for just a second? I want to engage you for just, just a moment. I'm not sure I entirely understand the very last comment. Is this something separate and apart from what we are doing with community choice aggregation through the triple CE? Is this something different you're talking about? That's a great question. Tiffany, you might know. It's another CCA. It's it's the same. It's a Silicon Valley CCA. Yeah. Um, they all do have different renewable energy contents. Some use different procurement methods, like using renewable energy credits gotcha. to achieve zero carbon. That is papering over, though, and we don't do that with our CCA. It was one of the prideful things that we did that we weren't going to paper over. Right. So we do have a bit higher emission factor, but they are committed to procuring 100% renewable by 2030 and are well on their way. We knew um, because of the shift in the procurement strategy yes. that it was going to look like emissions are going up, mm -hmm. but really it's we have a true accounting of our emissions versus papering over in the past with renewable energy credits. Very so good. we do have a CCA, Silicon Valley Clean Energy procures, I believe, in a different kind of way than our CCA. I wonder which is cheaper. Part, I'm sorry, yeah, 3C is cheaper than PG&E. Yay. <laughs> thank you, thank mm -hmm. you for your testimony today. Thank you for being here. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hello, and thank you, City of Santa Cruz City Council members. My name is Sophia Schwartzke, and I am a Customer Accounts Manager with Central Coast Community Energy, or 3CE. And I'm here this afternoon to express 3CE's support for the city's single family residence ordinance and its local amendments to the California Energy Code. Santa Cruz has demonstrated climate leadership through its climate action program with goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. The proposed code amendment promoting electrification aligns with these goals and is supported by 3CE's rebates and incentives. Homes with all electric appliances save approximately 2.5 metric tons of carbon annually, equivalent to removing a gas-powered car from the road. In support of this, 3CE provides rebates for switching from gas-powered water heaters and HVAC equipment to all electric models. 
We also offer incentives for appliance costs, electric panel upgrades, and replacements. Single family rebuilds from governor declared natural disasters since January 2020 are eligible for up to $15,000 in rebates. Additionally, we offer a $2,000 rebate for new single family homes that are all electric and a $5,000 rebate for accessory dwelling units or ADUs with the option to receive up to $10,000 for two new ADUs. To support contractors in electrifying existing buildings, we provide free high quality workforce education and training on installing the latest heat pump technology along with access to streamlined permitting and financial resources. Contractors can apply for incentives and be listed in Tech Clean California's Find a Contractor database and receive hands-on support, especially for those working in low-income communities. Electrification is a strategic priority for our governing boards due to its cost-effectiveness, efficiency, improved indoor air quality, and significantly lower operational emissions compared to natural gas appliances. Residential and commercial buildings contribute about 25% of California's greenhouse gas emissions, according to the California Air Resources Board. Together with the city of Santa Cruz, 3CE and 3CE are poised to achieve our climate and clean energy goals, and we strongly support this REACH Code initiative. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you very much. Very much appreciated, and I think that uh, the city manager and I uh, as folks who sit on a policy board and a technical board over at Triple CE are very impressed with the work of the staff and the enterprise. So thank you for calling in and thank you for your fine work. Dr. Weiss-West, let me uh, ask about another aspect of this. Will, will you go to the issue of how we would deal with affordable housing units and either multifamily or uh, the ADU is interesting to me in that regard uh, because it is at least now being embraced as a form of affordable housing. Um, not always, but more so than, let's say, a large structure. So let's go, let's go back to that issue uh, if we can and get your think, current thinking on how to deal with the affordable, excuse me, the affordability question that's obviously embedded in this. <clears throat> so what I can say um, about this topic, I'm not prepared to speak to the multifamily piece only because we have not been analyzing that to date. But um, as far as affordable housing, I can really only speak to our grant proposal. Um, that is really the nexus in which I come into affordable housing, which included standing up a tenant protection affordability fund as well as a climate resilience fund that would fund these kind of improvements for low-income households. That was what was proposed, as well as um, some other technical assistance and things like that. That's really the nexus at which this particular policy has been conceived in the context of affordable housing. I don't know if planning is thinking about this in a different way. I don't think that gets at what exactly you're looking at, but I don't know if maybe you have a, a follow-up question. Is that? Sure. Let, a, me, uh, let okay. me get a little more. Let me go into uh, okay. just a little bit more. So let's say there's an existing 20-unit apartment building, and that apartment building mm, is an affordable, uh, and I want to distinguish here between those that are what we would say legally affordable, if you will, uh, versus those that are at the lower end of the rent scale that may or may not be, mm -hmm. you know, regulated as as affordable. So I'm trying to go to the affordability issue or the the lower income rental opportunities in our city. So we're not talking about new construction, I understand that. We're talking about a renovation. So I, I don't think it's a surprise that 
I think all of us have been contacted uh, from time to time, let's say by COPA, who advocates on behalf of low-income residents, oftentimes uh, low-income Spanish speakers, uh, oftentimes in beach flats, for example. And then we will look at an issue or hear about it and we'll say, oh my goodness, you know, it has this problem and this problem and this problem and uh, we need to take some action on this. Uh, either the city does or the owner of the property or whatever. Um, I'm trying to go to that issue and understand what the implications are on the lower income side of things and the cost of rental, which I'm not going to give the speech on that. We all know the speech on that in our community. So I'm trying to understand what would happen a 20-unit, a 10-unit, doesn't matter to me what the number of units, some number of unit uh, structure. And the landlord said, well, you know, while I'm at it with this roof repair, I, I think I'm going to do a couple other things here as well. And you cross over the threshold. Of, of what the cost is there. Uh, and Because as I understand it, if you're under a certain threshold, you're exempt as a project. You're exempt up to that 20%. Yes, right. Yes. So now we, we come to a situation where uh, the trigger, you cross the trigger threshold. And we're, we have over here on this end a desire for affordable housing and actually more of it than we have now because of the marketplace we're in. Help me square this circle about how we're trying to do that. We have older properties, a lot of older properties. Somebody says it's about time we did X, Y, or Z on it. Help me understand how in that multifamily situation, here come additional costs uh, that are, we are choosing to impose those costs. Uh, can you help me understand whether there exists, whether it's triple CE or the state of California or the energy commission or the PUC or PG, whoever it is, are there ways to essentially mitigate the cost increase because those are absolutely going to be passed on to the renter. Yes, there there are rebates, incentives, tax credits available for multifamily. As I mentioned, we haven't really been focusing on multifamily, so this is really just in concept, and what I'm saying also applies to single family. But yes, there are incentives available um, that will defray the cost. The other piece that I think is really difficult in this context is that when you think about cost effectiveness, mm -hmm. there's two components. There's the, the sunk cost, and then there's the cost of operating the building over time. Yeah. And how do you, this has kind of always been the rub with the, with the renter uh, owner relationship is how does, how, how does the, um, the owner who puts in the investments recoup the cost effectiveness if they're not paying the bill? Right, and that continues to be a question. I think the best that we can do is ensure that their costs are defrayed as much as possible upon that construction piece to ensure that you know we don't we don't have to uh, kind of solve for this this mm -hmm. ongoing evergreen issue regarding who benefits from energy efficiency or solar, quite frankly, between renters and owners. There are things called green leases. We explored them about five years ago. There's not a lot of interest to adopt green leases where you actually define, okay, when you exceed this amount, you know, you, you look at all those costs and make sure that it is balanced uh, versus, you know, just allowing costs to be passed on. So not the perfect answer, um, but, you know, that is, I think, what, what we can do is make sure that the incentives exist, that people know how to access them, and then potentially looking back into that green lease and seeing is that a structure or model we want to promote to help solve for that renter-owner disconnect on who benefits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, uh, I, I'm not sure that this, my next question should be directed to you. Perhaps it should be directed to Mr. Butler, but... Uh, 
the general question here, whoever would wish to respond to it, is uh, operationally when someone would come in, uh, let's assume a fact, not an evidence, which is that that flow chart you showed us over time about when you know, first reading, second reading, so on, operational, et cetera. Um, let's, let's assume that that's all happened. And now someone comes in and would the uh, planning slash building department, uh, would someone have to ask for, uh, I'm looking to do this, they're advised uh, this submittal will trigger on this. Uh, are they then offered or provided with information how to reduce that cost through range of credits and so on? Or are they assumed to know that themselves and they, they go take care of it? Um, we will provide to the building division the updates on the incentives as they're available because they do come in and out. So we will make that available. Um, as far as walking th folks through that, that would not be um, the building division's responsibility. That's why, again, I'm looking at other services like Quick Carbon that can walk folks through the rebates that, you know, that is kind of their bread and butter is helping folks to understand the choices and the incentives that are available. I don't know if the planning department wants to talk about the details of their intake or whatnot. That is not something that I know, but you are touching upon that to some degree. Thank you, Dr. Weisswest. I am interested in hearing from the building department if they have a comment on this about it. Whoa, John, be careful there. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Jackson, Green Building Specialist. Uh, Green Building Program does provide tax incentives for people during the design phase. Uh, that could be something they could use for something like this. Either step closer to the microphone or oh. pull it closer to it. Thank you, sir. The Green Building Program does provide tax incentives and information on that during the design phase. That is something they could use for a program similar to what Tiffany's offering. Kind of a light touch type thing, right? Yeah. Yes. I think I have a slightly different question, uh, which is, are we, do we actively or passively provide people with the information? Again, let's assume now we're in January of next year, which I understand is the effective date of April year. 1. April 1. Mm -hmm. We're in April 1 of next year. It's operational. They're in the department. Somebody walks up to the counter and says, I, I want to do this. Um, they are advised that it triggers on certain activities or certain requirements that are implicated in this ordinance. When that happens, and that person is advised of that, are they also advised of the opportunities available for them to reduce that cost by accessing one or more programs? Is this an active thing they are told about? As of right now, that is something they are actively provided uh, once they submit for a design review. Uh, but I think it would be beneficial for us to put together some pamp pamphlets uh, for those that come to the counter and just inquire about these, uh, about their project and the scope of work at hand. Okay. It does seem to me, I mean, I'm interested in how active we can be on this for folks. I think for, I, I have no idea on this actually, but I, I'm imagining that for Many people, I'll say that, for many people, uh, they've done a lot of work, they've, they've checked out things, they've now gotten a, a designer to help them get through this, uh, you know, put the, uh, the remodel together or the addition of bedroom and a bathroom, whatever it might be. And they come in and they do this, and they've got some thought in their mind about what the costs are going to be and so on. This maybe depending upon how they've pursued that either the first time or not the first time they've heard about this so they then either have factored it in or not factored it in but if it's a bit of a surprise to them it's going to be a pretty hefty number for them this will surprise them and i would think that we should also as we're saying this is a requirement here are the ways you can reduce that cost. That it is an active engagement with that person rather than, I'm not diminishing the value of the pamphlet. I could see where 
prior to submittal, that could be useful to them. I, I understand that. I'm more interested, at this point anyway, in understanding that active role of the department in assisting someone in reducing compliance costs on this. And I'm especially interested in this at the whatever we could characterize here as lower income efforts. Somebody wants to do something and we look at it and uh, they're taking their uh, two bedroom, one bath and want to add a bedroom. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be way up the income scale. I understand that if you're a homeowner, you know, that's going to cost you a million dollars to buy that house anyway. But now you come in. So I'm trying to get to this issue of, of where, how it is we not only gain compliance, but frankly, politically, how we sustain the public support for that compliance, where someone is told, here's a $6,000 new piece that you weren't anticipating. And by the way, you can reduce that by $5,000 by doing this, this, and this, going on applying for this, this, and this. Do you see where I'm going? I've belabored the point enough, but I'm interested in understanding. I was going to say, you know, we do need to develop what is the internal process here. You know, we, that still is to come, so this feedback is very appreciated with respect to that. I'm also interested in, in exploring, exploring when this comes back uh, on that flow chart. Next time we see this, I, I am interested in seeing uh, how, not um, how it is we can reduce the cost because of the availability, <coughs> excuse me, of other funding. how we can advise that property owner how they can achieve compliance at the least cost to them because the government in any one of its manifestations has programs that allow that to, to happen. Um, I, I, my experience in government tells me that we on our side of this have a you end up with a really good, well, I want to be careful. You end up with an understanding that's probably above the understanding of rank and file residents of our city. We have a higher level of understanding of all the complexities of government and all the requirements and so on and so on. Some people, this is going to be the one and one only time they interact with the planning department or the government because they want to do a specific thing. They're going to do it once, they're never going to do it again. And so for them, and my guess is that's, that's a fair number of this 300 uh, are, are in that category. I don't know that. I'd be interested in knowing when we're talking about these 600 applications uh, that you're processing uh, each year, uh, how those are segmented, if you will. Here's somebody coming in for this. That's over the threshold. Here's somebody, something bigger. Here's something quite a bit bigger. Here's one that's a single family residence. Here's a category of ADUs. Here's multifamily, so on. Uh, I'm trying to get a sense of, of, of this impact uh, that people are going to experience and how we are going to provide them with what is already there by way of relief. Then the other question for me is, as we explore this when it comes back, is if we know that delta between the cost and the subsidies available, I'm especially interested in understanding this with reference to how we, with what we define as low income housing or affordable housing, which may not be the same thing. Okay, thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. I have a couple of things that I thought of again after hearing you speak. And, um, and one, in terms of affordable housing or low-income housing, some of the reasons those units are affordable is because they're on the tail end of their you know, useful life. And once somebody makes that investment, it's going to 
um, you know, naturally raise the cost of that space. Um, and so when I was reading through the cost effectiveness retrofit study, they didn't, it said on page um, 15 um, that electrical service panel upgrades are not included in the um, analysis. Did you guys have an idea of what that would be? A, a panel upgrade? Yeah. We do. Sure. Um, in it. fact, I thought I had an extra slide, but I think I might have taken it out here. Um, a, a panel upgrade, it, it can vary, but it can be uh, $1,500 and up. So that isn't what I got. I talked to two electrical contractors that told me closer to 15000 is what that would cost. It, it depends. And for a single family home. And so for me, I just want to make sure that we're realistic in factoring that in with the cost for folks. And the other thing in terms of um, the rebates and credits, I think we should also be realistic when we're advertising this. If someone's affording a million dollar house and doing this work, they're in a different tax bracket that isn't going to qualify for some of these that some of these and so I think sure. we're you know we see these rebates are available to you we should put asterisks if you're in this income category because I don't want to just sugarcoat everything for people and then it's really shocking and then who's going to get um, you know the backlash is the person sitting at the counter who we're hoping is just somebody there so I just think when we're making the nice pamphlets and when we're promoting all this let's let's be realistic with what things cost and you know and that's that's uh, an ask, I guess. Sure. I mean, the, the costs vary. It's it's site by site, most definitely. And um, the as far as the income's concerned, usually they're income tiered. So you'll get a greater amount if your income is lower. There's typically, sometimes for EVs, there's only low income tax incentives. But we would certainly characterize that as it's presented. I mean, we're not trying to imply that there are 100% tax credits for everyone. I, sorry, if I wasn't trying to assume that you were. I'm just saying that I've seen like the glossy printed things where it's like you qual you could get this paid for or whatever, and then it's like, then you read, 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 read. And it's like, sure. well, no, I, I couldn't. Maybe someone could, but could that person even afford to buy it, whatever it is? And so I just want, I, I just think when we're putting our material out, I want it to be as honest as possible, even if it doesn't sound as good. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Councilmember Brunner, did you? I thought I heard you had a question while I. So please, you are recognized. Thank you. I think, um, you know, I appreciate the points that you're bringing up. And I, you know, it's for me, it's almost assumed that that would be part of this. But if it needs council direction, in, in, even though this is a study session, um, in making sure that that's part of this work as we move forward um, and that the information, resources, incentives, rebates are at every touch point. And I think it's really hard. Um, sometimes pamphlets are helpful, um, but incentives and rebates change. Each one has different criteria and eligibility requirements based on whatever that provider of incentive is requesting. So, you know, I think the point is um, this body is advocating for the people, the community, the low-income folks, that if we're requiring or encouraging um, compliance, that it's not um, any in any way an extreme increase in the rent of a tenant. And maybe it's defined by if it increases their rent a certain amount, a certain percentage, whatever. But just keeping that in mind as this work goes forward, that it's not on the back of a low-income tenant, mm -hmm. that um, you know the rent would only increase. I don't know legally what we can do, and I haven't. Um, I, I think that's the point that we're we're trying to advocate for. Um, if it's you know not a choice and we're moving in this direction, let's make sure that we're also considering um, anybody who's in a low income category. And let's make sure the customer service and the staff is knowledgeable at every touch point to provide helpful resources. And maybe that looks like a landing page on the city website that can easily be changed as incentives and rebates and information change, whatever the logistics. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that can be worked out. Um, yeah, but I think that that's, now. you know, a great point to just keep in mind. Absolutely. Uh, being the health and all policies lead, it's top of mind for me. Um, like you said, though, we do have limited levers yeah. with respect to this, and that's why we try to pursue the grant funding for the aff uh, affordable housing, tenant protection, and climate resilience fund yes. to help with low-income folks. So we are trying in this all way. Um, but and Spanish, English, like all the things that we assume are going to be part of it, I don't think um, I don't want to have to like go through a list in my head about naming out loud what should be part of this. Like, mm -hmm. we hope that that is um, part of everything. I hear you. Thank you, council member. Are there further questions or comments by council members? Um, I aired in uh, ending the public comment a little early. We had someone online. I didn't realize there are, we are going to take that person's comment. Person online, good evening and welcome to the council meeting. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, my name is Tom White. I live on the west side and I'm pleased to also serve in the Mary Stark Climate Action Task Force. Uh, I had a uh, opportunity to review this proposal ahead of time and certainly offer my full support for it. Um, and I think there's been excellent discussion and, uh, and excellent responses uh, throughout the meeting. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there in person. I want to mention um, just one aspect that's come up that it. The, uh, the upgrades are designed to be cost effective uh, and the policy has been designed to offer a very high degree of flexibility uh, to choose the most cost effective measures for each individual uh, you know, retrofit or, or option. The net effect of that is that the total cost of the buildings plus the energy used for a household are decreased. That's not the definition of cost effectiveness. Uh, and it's, you know, while no one wants to pay more, uh, you know, for, for rent or for their loan, it is a, a benefit to each household to pay, for instance, $40 more in rent or, or mortgage payments in order to save $80 a month in electric bills. The, the, the savings should more than offset the cost of the time. Uh, and so the aim of this is to actually make it more affordable live uh, in a unit which is more efficient. That's the, the goal of efficiency. There's also an earlier question about sort of the, the cost per ton of, uh, you know, for GHG, you know, for building efficiency. And while you could try to think of it that way, um, it, I'd say that isn't really that meaningful because to the degree that a, an efficiency measure uh, for renovations are cost effective based on reduced bills, then the GHG reduction is actually a free ancillary benefit. You're not paying for the GHG reduction, you're paying to have lower energy bills. Uh, that means you're using less energy, which means there are fewer emissions and associated health benefits to that. Um, but just to bring that into context, this isn't that we are you know, adding additional costs in order to have you know, a more amorphous emission reduction. We're adding additional um, costs in order to increase efficiency in order to reduce the total costs. And that's the, the aim and, and goal of this, and I think largely uh, accomplishes that. So, you know, there can't be individual exceptions, and that's why those are, are considered and built into the, the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Appreciate it. Further questions, comments by board members? Uh, by members. Uh, let me say, we, uh, uh, un un unless there is a need for a motion, I think there was uh, clear indications from council members as to what their uh, inquiries are and their thoughts about this. Uh, Members, do you feel a need for a motion? I, okay, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity in the event we would do that. Dr. Wisewest, thank you very, very much for the fine work that you do. This is a, an enormously complicated issue, uh, and we are going to have to do enormously complicated work in order to achieve success. And uh, uh, I think as we go through each one of these, uh, having your good analytical brain applied to it together with uh, the planning department and others who uh, staff this little government of ours. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that. I will say from my own 
uh, in terms of thinking about this going forward, um, I view this essentially as a as a, in the legislative environment, this would be the equivalent of an interim hearing. We haven't introduced a bill yet. The bill will be introduced later on, and we'll have a series of readings on those. So uh, I want to be very clear that uh, I'm in the, at the moment, I am in the position of saying, I understand the objective we're trying to achieve, where we're trying to go. I have a number of questions about this, and so I will be very interested in seeing the first draft and first reading of an ordinance, uh, which uh, I think we should expect will undergo a series of amendments and revisions as it moves its way through, uh, because these, uh, these are uh, serious issues that impact people's uh, lives very directly. And again, thank you for your very good work. Thank you to the other staff members who are here from the planning department. Thank you for your very good work. Unless there is a further business to come before us, the vice mayor may want to make a motion. So moved. Oh, uh, to motion to adjourn. And uh, non-debatable, there's a second by Mr. Newsom. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries and so forth. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your valuable comments.